Eind 2015 vindt in een chique Londens hotel de Europese presentatie plaats van een nieuwe bank. De Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. De bank was aanvankelijk bedoeld om infrastructurele projecten in Zuidoost-Azië te financieren. Maar werd in een mum van tijd gezien als een alternatief voor de gevestigde orde van het Internationaal Monetair Fonds en de Wereldbank. Die beheerde decennia lang de internationale geldvoorraden en bepaalde de economische samenwerking en ontwikkeling volgens westerse maatstaven en belangen. Tot grote ergernis van de Verenigde Staten werd ook Groot-Brittannië lid van deze nieuwe Chinese bank. En dat is volgens China-watcher Martin Jacques, schrijver van het boek When China Rules the World, een historisch gegeven. 2015 has been a historic year for Chinese UK relations and it started with a dramatic development that no one really foresaw which was the decision of the UK to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank until that moment the 21 members were all from Asia and then suddenly the UK joined against the opposition of the United States, which had been lobbying hard against countries joining the AIB. Now that is really significant, because it reaches into the heart of the West, into the heart of the Western Alliance. I think what it means is that the rise of China is transforming the geometry of the world. It's unimaginable that in 10 years' time, the international financial system as we know it now will still be intact, because it won't. It will be new, and it will be drawn increasingly gravitationally towards China. Die nieuwe bank wordt geleid door Chin Li Chung, die in het verleden werkzaam was bij de Wereldbank. Hij spreekt onomwonden over een nieuwe standaard, wat betreft het leiderschap in het internationaal financieel systeem. Over the last three decades. We managed to lift 600 million people out of poverty. We do not intend to have China's development experience fully rep replicated in other developing countries, but we believe this is inspiration. That's why we want to have this back. I think that it's an introduction also of the way in which the Chinese see the transformation of their own society because their understanding is this quite simply that really china was transformed by its economic growth and crucial to this economic growth was infrastructure huge investment in infrastructure and they their conception is that this is vital to the transformation of the developing world. I think they have a feel, they have a sense, a priority concerning the developing world, which is quite different from the way the West and the developed world looks at it. However, we believe to have a new development approach to helping developing countries tackle poverty reduction, environmental protection, improving the livelihood of these people is key. And we would like to have a new development approach. That is why the Chancellor leader wants to have this bank. That is why we want to have this bank to be managed by the highest possible international standard. But let me qualify this statement. When we say international best practice, I'm sorry, Martin, this is not the Western standard. The international best practice is not the Western standard. It's a standard Western countries, Asian countries, Latinos, we all work together to create. The international standard incorporates the best of experience, development experience, over the last half century. And I'm proud to say China's development is a part of this experience. Maybe I should stop here so that you could have questions for me. Martin Jacques woonde jarenlang in Hong Kong. Hij verbaast zich al lang over een aantal westerse veronderstellingen over de Chinese ontwikkeling, die volgens hem de plank volledig mislaan. Het is hoog tijd om de toekomst opnieuw te duiden. This is a different way of thinking to what we see. They know it's not their system. 
China doesn't bear the same relationship to the international system as the United States. The United States was the architect, the founder, the patron, the landlord. Yeah. Really, China's like the tenant. So the Chinese are not under any illusions about all this. You know, that this is a world calibrated by and um, made in the first instance for the United States and 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 also for Europe, especially historically Western Europe. So, um, so I think what their approach is and will be is step by step. If they identify a problem and a need, they will step forward and make a suggestion. They didn't use the step forward because for a long time they just kept quiet because they didn't want to upset the boat, they knew, you know, they didn't want to antagonise unnecessarily, um, and they were too preoccupied with dragging themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, out of poverty. So that was the Chinese preoccupation. Now they're in a different situation. They can start thinking, well, you know, about the world. You know, that's part of what the Chinese dream is about. What place are we going to occupy in the world? The Chinese president launched a new international bank on Saturday in Beijing that's being seen as a rival to the US-led World Bank. US opposition has failed to deter its allies from signing up to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, including Australia, Britain, Germany and South Korea. The Chinese-inspired or Chinese-led or Chinese-shaped globalization is a new era that is unfolding before it. De Aziatische Investeringsbank is onderdeel van een enorm Chinees initiatief, genaamd One Belt, One Road. China lanceert en financiert grote infrastructurele projecten, die steeds meer landen moeten verbinden met China als middelpunt. En dan is de nieuwe zijderoute een feit. Het netwerk begon met landen in Oost-Azië, maar breidde zich al snel uit naar Pakistan, Iran, Rusland, Turkije en enkele Europese voorposten. De Griekse havenstad Piraeus is er één van. Toen Griekenland in 2015 feitelijk failliet was en Europa steeds strengere eisen stelde om de Grieken tegemoet te komen, zag China zijn kans schoon. Het Chinese staatsbedrijf Costco nam grote delen van de Griekse haven in Piraeus over. Hier zien we de contouren van de nieuwe Chinese wereldorde. There is a presumption that we are the model for everyone else, that everyone else should be like us. There is an assumption that as they develop and they modernize, they westernize. And of course, there is an element of truth in that, but the assumption that modernity only comes in one size and one form, and it's a Western form, is deeply flawed. It is wrong. We have been able to assume for the last 200 years that the world's furniture is ours. Why do so many people speak English? Why, why is the dollar, you know, or before that, the pound, the world's currency? Um, why are the global institutions our institutions? IMF, World Bank, it's been our world, we've owned it. And we won't anymore. So the world will become, is becoming, I don't need to say we, we will anymore, is becoming less and less Western and less and less, therefore, familiar to us. So we have to make a big shift in the way we think. We have to de develop a new kind of respect for the other, for other cultures for other ways of doing things. And this is going to be very difficult. In the new world order, it is of belang that we China learn to understand. Who thinks China? Where is their future vision based? We 
gaan op bezoek bij Yang Shuitong, politiek strateeg aan de Tsinghua Universiteit in Beijing. So this is my book. I argue that the China will become the superpower by. 这个西方人呢，他们有这么一个个认为，他们是经济决定论。某种程度上来讲呢，他们和马克思对问题的认识是一致的。他们是一种什么思想呢？说人啊是一个经济的动物。当人们的生活水平改善了以后呢，他们的这个思想观念呢就会发生变化。那当他们的生活的物质生物质生活条件一样的时候呢，他们的思想想法会一样。这是他们认识中国的错误的根源。就是他们是个经济决定论者，他们不知道人是一个政治动物，人他对世界的认识，他不仅仅来源于他的物质生活，还要来源于他的社会生活。The the Chinese have a much more positive view of human nature than we do, you know, because in the Christian tradition, um, uh, uh, you know, we need to be saved from ourselves, from our sins. The Chinese don't have that view. The Chinese view is that, uh, you know, if you are brought up in the right kind of way, your parents, are, you're subject to good parenting and good influences and good education, you'll be, you can be a good person. So it's a much more positive philosophy than, than the Christian tradition. It and 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 the Christian tradition. 他有一个使命，他总是要把别的人不信基督教的人变成信基督教，把和自己生活方式不一样的人变成用自己的生活方式来生活。中国不是正好相反。美国的为什么我们中国认为美国的政策叫霸权主义呢？它是霸道，不是王道。就在于美国是对外输出自己的价值观，就是说，比如说他我说去解放利比亚。解放伊拉克，他认为伊拉克的政治制度和意识形态跟我不一样，我把你们解放了，人让你们跟我们一样，这是从儒家思想讲，这是很错误的一个的。儒家讲的是叫做来而不拒，不往教之，就你要跟我学，我教你；你要不跟我学，我绝不会去你那儿来派军队去改造你，这是错误的。霸权主义就是用暴力来改变别人的思想和制度。而中国的传统观念里边讲道义是不能去改变别人，这是区别。美国就是太希望把别的国家变得跟美国一样。<笑> In the long run, of course, the international system will be utterly transformed by the rise of China. Utterly transformed. It is inconceivable that this will not happen. The fact is that. Um, since the financial crisis, uh, the global economy has been extremely dependent on the performance of the Chinese economy, much more dependent on the Chinese economy than the American economy, much greater contributor to global growth than the, the American economy has been nearly stagnant. The Chinese economy has carried on growing. And I think that, the, the, that this is, uh, this is um, sort of in some way recognized now by the reaction, the concern in the West about the health of the Chinese economy. Die zorg is er zeker. Na decennia van welhaast hallucinante groeicijfers sloeg in de nazomer van 2015 de stemming om. De Chinese centrale bank ging totaal onverwachts over tot een devaluatie van de Chinese munt, de renminbi, die tot dan toe gekoppeld was aan de dollar. Het gevolg was een verlies aan vertrouwen in de levensader van de mondiale economie, wat leidde tot paniek op aandelen en valutamarkten. Investeerder Jim Rogers vertrok al voor de financiële crisis van 2008 naar Singapore, dichtbij de Chinese gouden bergen. Wat zijn volgens hem de gevolgen van een Chinese crisis? The Chinese currency has been the strongest currency in the world for the past 10 years. Now, China has its own problems too. Uh, in 2008, when the world had a problem, China had huge amounts of money saved up for a rainy day. It started raining, they started spending. But now China too has debt. 
China's built up a fair amount of debt here in the past eight years, which they never had before for historic reasons. So China's going to be in more difficulty this time around than before. Okay. Um, so what caused this debt of China? Well, partly when the, when the world got into trouble and the Chinese government started spending money, they encouraged all the provinces and companies to spend money as well. And so they went out and started borrowing money. Uh, that now there's a, a, a market in China for, for lending much more than it ever was before at the banks and outside the banks. We are facing worse times than we had in 2008 because the debt is so, so, so much higher now and the money printing has been staggering since then. The central bank in the United States in, 19, in 2008 had a balance sheet of 800 million U.S. dollars. Now it has nearly five trillion. It's gone up over 500 percent, 600 percent in those seven or eight years. That is a lot of debt. Uh, the U.S. government debt is up by trillions since then. Europe, you talk about austerity. No country in Europe has lower debt now than it had in 2008 or even last year. Every European country has higher debt this year than last year, and next year the debt's going to be higher again. So, no, we've got staggering amounts of debt now. Staggering amounts of money have been printed. It's going to be worse next time around. Be worried. And so we don't have China to save us this time. Well, China is in better shape than most of us, but China, too, has debt now. China's built up its own debt. Nothing like the U.S., nothing like some of the European countries, nothing like Great Britain. But China, too, has debt now. I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. I don't like it either. <laughs> Let me say again, you should be knowledgeable, you should be worried, and you should be prepared. I don't like it at all. You know, I'd like to just be able to look out the window and say, oh, things are great. I don't have to think and worry about anything. But now I look out the window and I see artificial oceans of liquidity, artificial liquidity. I see storms coming. De wereldwijde storm die Jim Rogers voorziet woedt al volop in Amerika. Maar wat is precies de relatie tussen het Chinese financiële beleid en de paniek in het Westen? Volgens investeerder Peter Schiff spelen de Chinezen een spel dat uiteindelijk zal leiden tot een ander monetair systeem waarin niet langer de dollar leidend zal zijn. I don't think it was the Chinese devaluation that caused it. In fact, markets were falling before the Chinese did that. It is why they did it. It's because the world is bracing for higher interest rates in the United States and for the strong dollar to continue to strengthen. And that's what put all the pressure on the Chinese currency because the Chinese RMB has been rising in value along with the dollar relative to all of the currencies of its trading partners. And so the Chinese are now trying to allow their currency to trade more freely with other currencies instead of being rigidly fixed to the dollar. Peter Schiff denkt dat Amerika de schuld voor de eigen economische problemen in de schoenen van China wil schuiven. Ron Brandt een strijd tussen twee economische supermachten, waarbij de heerschappij van de valuta op het spel staat. Well, I think the Chinese realize the extent to which the United States is in trouble. I mean, they have to. And the question is, how do the Chinese go about preparing for it? I mean, it's always puzzled me that the Chinese would have enabled this to go on for so long. I mean, look how many dollars they've accumulated. I mean, we owe them trillions. And obviously, that can't go on forever. And it's only going on now because people haven't come to that conclusion. They still think America is good for its debts. When they figure out that it's not, it's, it's a game changer. And I think the dollar is ultimately going to collapse. And when that happens, the Chinese RMB is going to take off. I think this is a head fake move with the Chinese currency going down. The real move is going to be upwards. And, you know, it's, this is a two edged sword. Yes, the Chinese are allowing the, their currency to fall now, but that means they're preparing to allow it to rise once the dollar turns direction. And if the Chinese are no longer there, 
to prop up the dollar, the next time it falls, it's not going to stop. And that's imminent. Yes, and I, and I think the Chinese understand this, and I think the Chinese are preparing for a post-U.S. dollar reserve currency world. I think that's one of the reasons that they've been buying up so much gold. You know, the Chinese are the world's largest producers of gold, but they don't export any of it. They actually import gold. And I think the government has been less than honest about how much gold they actually own, because I don't think they want the markets to realize how large their appetite is. And I do believe that over the last few years, as so many speculators have been selling gold on the anticipation of this strong dollar and rising interest rates, I think the Chinese have been quietly buying. Well, I think, again, I think that's going to be a positive development. I think the monetary system we have now does not work. I mean, you can't really have a monetary system without money, and that's what we have. Uh, we just have a little piece of paper, but there's no intrinsic value there. I mean, gold is money because gold is a commodity. I mean, money needs to be a commodity. It has to have value. It can't just be a piece of paper that governments can create out of thin air uh, because there's no limit to how much they can create. And you have no idea what the supply is going to be in the future. So I think the sooner we can get off the system that we're on now, the better. The international financial system is now in many ways is very flawed. We know that and we know it's unstable and we know we could hit another financial crisis and we know it's far too dependent on the dollar as a reserve currency and so on. New institutions will arise according to circumstances because ultimately it's about what the global economy requires, what it needs, what kind of financial reform is appropriate. The IMF and the World Bank will be increasingly marginal. The AIB has more capital than the World Bank. Yeah, and they're a startup. Or they're a start they're a startup, yeah. So the US and Japan have stayed out so far. What do you think about that? We are uh, have they been very foolish? I'm sorry, you should you pick your words more carefully. <laughs> no, that's your job, not mine. No, I never said they are foolish. I understand it might be difficult for some countries, for whatever reason, to make a decision to join. So my idea is very clear. The door keeps open for any country to join as long as they accept the articles agreement, which was worked out by the 57 founding members. However, Martin, I hope you won't think I'm not good enough or not nice enough. It's unfair for me to invite you to my party tonight again and again, and you reject again and again. That's not fair. China proposed改革IMF这个机构。中国要求增加在国际货币金中间的这个投票权。中国要求人民币加入 SDR。这个特别提款权，结果呢，遭到了美国的抵制。所以他不让中国进行这些金融改革。中国没有办法，只好搞设立一些个金融机构，是金专银行、呃亚投行、AIB，然后什么这个上合组织银行，然后和中欧的这
The dollar being the reserve currency is the stores, a source of financial instability throughout the world because the entire world is forced to support the United States. And it's a very expensive habit. And the fact that the dollar is so overvalued distorts decisions, it distorts capital flows. And as I said, it is the main source of financial problems and instability throughout the world. I mean, in order for China to keep its relationship with the dollar, they had to keep expanding their own money supply. They had to keep interest rates too low. They had to keep printing money. So all of this distorts the economy. But the main difference between China and the United States is China's economy is still viable. China has an enormous industrial capacity. China has all sorts of production. And, and so when this, this collapse happens, the difference between America and China is China is still going to have all the factories and they're going to have all the production. What's going to change is their consumers. Chinese citizens are going to have all the goods that these factories produce. America is going to have to go without that. We're just going to have the money we print. But what good is that? I mean, money doesn't have any value if you can't buy anything with it. The sooner the world gets off this dollar standard, the better off the world is going to be. En zo treden we de onvermijdelijke Chinese wereldorde binnen. Een orde die duidelijke contouren laat zien. Geen hegemonie afdwingen, maar bewondering veroorzaken, zodat iedereen wil zijn als jij. China historically has had a culturally very different way of looking at its relationship with the world. I think what we'll see is a world in which China exercises far more economic power than the United States ever has, even at its peak. But it won't be a political... It, it, won't, it won't interfere in the governance of other countries in the way in which the Western tradition has. And... That, that era that we've, we, that, that we've lived through has been, in my view, an extremely authoritarian and undemocratic world system. And the great change that's happening now is that with the rise of the developing world, where 85% of the world's population lives, they increasingly are acquiring, are being enfranchised, acquiring a voice, acquiring a say in the future of the world. So in a rough and ready way, this is something to be hugely embraced. We are moving towards a world which is no longer essentially ruled by a tiny minority of the human population, as increasingly uh, uh, the majority of the world's population will be, as it were, in some way or other, running it. <laughs>